the origins of civilization, sort of a lot of things in science, a lot of things in life in general, you just assume or you've been indoctrinated. You get the dogma, you get the paradigm, you have a certain worldview, and many times I tell my students, they don't even acknowledge it, or we don't even acknowledge what we carry in our head, and we assume it is true. One thing specifically is the standard paradigm of the origin of civilization for many people. And this was taught as doctrine when I was a graduate student. And much of it owes its origins to a fellow named B. Gordon Child, who was rightfully so a great archaeologist and anthropologist, but he maybe went too far or was a bit too dogmatic, should we say. Uh, he was in the first half of the 20th century, and he didn't originate this, but he espoused it, sort of put it in textbook form, and many people to this day still carry it in their heads. And that is that when you go up to civilization, and I'm talking today about the antiquity and origins of civilization, to get there, humanity goes through basic stages. We start out as savages, in a technical sense, hunters, gatherers, have people heard that term before? Hunters, gatherers, foragers, it's generally assumed that hunters and gatherers are very primitive level, they don't know much, they're eking out a living, they're barely sort of scratching the surface of the ground, spending all their time just surviving. Actually, this is not quite true. It turns out that many anthropologists in modern day, they study living extant hunter-gatherers, but where were they living? They were living, or they are living, in marginal land because they've been displaced by other people. Uh, so you have hunter-gatherers, then you have the barbarians in a classic sense, a technical sense, and barbarians might have a little bit of early cultivation, they have some agriculture, they might live in villages, so it's sort of the rise of humanity through the stages of development. And then ultimately we arrive at, or we progress to, or we, um, you know, achieve the highest uh, status, and that is true civilization. And how do you recognize true civilization or high culture? Among other things, you have monumental architecture, often built from stone, later from concrete, that type of thing, monumental architecture, sophisticated technologies, and literacy. Literacy is often something that archaeologists will associate, and historians will associate with true civilization. And you have cities. And this last stage, that stage of civilization, the paradigm stated very clearly, was only arrived about 4,000 to 3,000 BC, you can call it 3,500 BC, in Mesopotamia. Everyone's heard of Mesopotamia? Um, had some horrible wars there recently. But in Mesopotamia, and this 3,500 BC is really, really important. Keep it in mind. If you go back before 3500 BC, so the paradigm says, by definition, effectively, you don't have civilization. Don't even bother looking for it at an earlier period than five or six thousand years ago. So this was a standard paradigm. Just as a side note, and we'll come back to this later, and especially in my talk tomorrow, people like Plato, the great philosopher Plato, he talked about world ages. In fact, many cultures talk about world ages and advanced civilizations much earlier than 3,500 BC. Of course, he did not use that calendar, but he talked about, for instance, Atlantis, with the ring city of Atlantis in the more general country, if you would, of Atlantis. Actually, I'll mention this now. If you take Plato's chronology and you put it into our calendar years, you come up with about 9600 BC for Atlantis and the destruction of Atlantis. Keep that date in mind. Of course, this is total nonsense from a classic academic point of view. It's just a legend. He's just telling a story to make, you know, a political statement or a philosophical argument is not to be taken literally. When I first started speaking, not speaking, first started researching ancient civilizations, 
I would not say the word Atlantis publicly. I laugh at myself now. But as an academic, if people thought you were, quote, looking for Atlantis, or interested in Atlantis as anything other than a literary device, you were basically laughed at and dismissed. So I wouldn't even say the word Atlantis at one point 20 years ago. Not only do we have Atlantis, we have things like the Yuga Cycle. People know what the Yuga Cycle is? Are the concept of gold, silver, bronze, iron age. And in Egypt, the uh, Egyptians, the very ancient Egyptians, dynastic Egyptians. And by the way, Atlantis, the concept of Atlantis, according to Plato, comes from Egypt. It came from Egypt to his um, ancestor who then passed it on. But the Egyptians had the concept of Zeptepi. And you can think of Zeptepi as, again, a golden age. Far back in the remote past, it was a time that uh, the gods, they talked about the gods being with humanity, civilization, sort of an early version of civilization, or an early cycle of civilization, I would call it, or the beginning of civilization, the time of creation, the first time a golden age when the gods lived among the humans. So even the dynastic Egyptians, 4,500 to 5,000 years ago, they did not think of themselves as the first civilization. They thought they were an inheritance or they had a legacy that they built on from an earlier civilization. So I go to Egypt in about 1990, not about exactly 1990 for the first time. At that point, I'm carrying in my head the paradigm that civilization began 3500 BC. And the Sphinx, according to all the Egyptologists, the classical Egyptologists, was carved de novo from scratch 2500 BC. I went to Egypt to see the Sphinx, and immediately I realized, as a geologist, I'm not an Egyptologist, I'm not an archaeologist, although I've done a lot of work now over the last 24 years in archaeology, I'm still a geologist, I look at things with a geological eye, and I realized that there was a problem. Not that it, well, this makes you sort of like what we do, I guess. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, John Anthony West, he's written a number of books like Serpent in the Sky, he is a proponent of the simplest school of ancient Egypt uh, that was founded by Schwar de Lubitsch. We could talk about that at length another time, or maybe another conference, but this is um, John Anthony West and an earlier incarnation of myself in about 1990, and we are standing in the Sphinx enclosure. Now something that's very important about the Sphinx is to give you a little background. It sits in what's known as the Sphinx enclosure. When the Sphinx was carved, it's carved out of solid bedrock. Only the head initially was above the level of the plateau. So to carve the body, they actually carved down into the bedrock. Uh, do you recognize me? That's me for scale. That's later. That's with a beard. But my point here is that this is the Sphinx enclosure. These are the back walls. This perspective's a little weird here, but this corresponds to this. We're looking up at the Sphinx. It's carved from limestone bedrock, and it sits largely below ground level. The body is below ground level. And it sits due east of the second pyramid, known as Copper's Pyramid, or Chevron's Pyramid, the pharaoh from about 2500 BC and it faces due east to the rising sun. This is a view from the south looking north. Can you see how they, it sits in an enclosure? Only the head was initially above ground level. Here's the Sphinx in the old photograph from the 20s or early 30s. There's a Sphinx, that's a second pyramid. There's the Great Pyramid. Actually, as a side note, you see how the Great Pyramid has eight sides, not four? People know that? It's slightly invented, but we could talk about it. Maybe sometime I'll be back to talk about the Great Pyramid. And that's the third pyramid. Another view, second pyramid, Sphinx. These are the temples in front of the Sphinx. And I want to point out here, the Sphinx sits in its enclosure once again. This temple is very, very important. Actually, both of these temples. This is known as the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple. 
these temples were built from limestone blocks that were cut out of the Sphinx enclosure when they carved the body. So, this temple here, and here's some people for scale, there's the Sphinx, the second pyramid. This temple is made out of huge limestone blocks, weighing tens of tons, some of them were talking 50 or more tons, and that temple is contemporaneous, was made at the same time as when they carved out the original body of the Sphinx. So it, to me, it's even more astounding, because if they could have carved out the body of the Sphinx just by taking kicks and chipping away the rock and shoveling it out, no, they actually carved out huge blocks and reassembled them to build this temple. Everyone follow? And if you doubt this, it's not just me saying this as a geologist. There was actually a geologist some decades ago now who as a master's thesis studied this by looking at the signatures, I'll call it, of the rocks, the particular layers, you can actually, he's been able to reconstruct where certain blocks went in the enclosure, like a huge three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Some of them are missing, the other ones he could say exactly where they are. So there's no doubt about this geologically. Just to give you some views, here is a person conveniently for scale, that's the um, Sphinx Temple. Look at the size of those blocks. I mean, talk about, if we're talking about megaliths, this is a megalithic temple. Uh, here's another view of it. This is actually a former student of mine and John Anthony West, and what they were doing here is measuring one of the blocks. Uh, so I'm a geologist. What was most interesting to me, and this is what I looked at initially, was the weathering and erosion on the Sphinx. Here is a view from the air, a couple of people, for, well, a few people for scale, and very important to me is this weathering on the Sphinx enclosure walls and the body of the Sphinx. And the core body, what I call the core body, this portion, shows a very specific type of weather. Very clear geologically, I've spoken to literally hundreds of geologists about this at geological conferences. Everyone agrees with me geologically that these, these walls, this rounded profile, you see the rounded profile? That is from water beating down rainwater running down the rocks. And I want to make a quick point right now. It is not from rising Nile floods. And it's sometimes people say to me, well, maybe the floods came and it rose up and did this weathering. No, that would show a different pattern geologically. It would show much more undercutting. This is from rainwater coming down, torrential rains from rainfall runoff. And it's, it's quite clear. But the problem is, where does the Sphinx sit? It sits on the edge of the Sahara Desert. We know geologically how old the Sahara Desert is. We know it's at least 5,000 years old. 5,000 years, you're talking 3,000 BC or so. When did the Egyptologists say the Sphinx was carved from scratch? 2,500 years. So there's a discrepancy there. There's a problem there. Does that make sense? So you see this, this is just a diagram to show how the water would run off and cut little gullies and get this rounded profile. Here's a younger me standing there. And notice, this is not a little bit of weather. This is an incredible amount of weather on what are actually fairly hard, fairly competent limestones. They're not limestones that you could call, that Michelangelo would, you know, carve a David out of. They're not that high quality, but they're not horrible limestones either, to sort of be colloquial. I mean, they're fairly hard, competent, good limestone. Here I am in one of the cracks that opens up along weaknesses, but again, it's cut out by water. It's, it's actually sort of classic karst topography geologically. Here's another view, uh, some more views. That is the, does everyone see the tail of the Sphinx there? That's John Anthony West standing for scale. And look at this. You see that was a goalie that was actually cut out and filled in in dynastic times. 
It was cut out by water erosion much earlier. The dynastic Egyptians apparently filled it in. Here we can see the rain erosion. Here is the, what you find, what you would expect if the Sphinx were only 2500 BC, only 4500 years old, you would expect wind erosion that gives a pattern like this. In both cases, you think of a layer cake. You have harder and softer layers. The softer layers erode, erode out preferentially, but they give a very different pattern. Can everyone see that? Here's um, just a diagram to show how the wind sort of cuts it out. Here is younger me looking at wind erosion. Can you see the difference? Here I am showing the wind erosion. You have this sort of desert varnish and patina. You cut out the softer layers. Uh, look at this. This is a, what I call wind tunnel effect. There's something amiss here that the Sphinx did not conform to the climate that we know has been in North Africa and Egypt for the last 5,000 years, that the evidence geologically, despite what the Egyptologists were telling us, indicated the Sphinx had to go back to this earlier period when it was much more moist, much more rainfall, much more temperate, and would give the type of weathering we see on the actual Sphinx. And not only did it have to go back to that earlier period, but it had to go considerably back into it to give the level of erosion that we see. Sometimes Egyptologists will say to me, oh, you know, it still rains in Giza, you still have flash floods, somehow these flash floods are going to cause a meter worth of erosion on solid limestone, it just doesn't work. I have been there when it rains. You know, it's rare, but I've seen rain on the Giza Plateau in the present day. That's not what we're talking about. 